All right. By the way, did George give you one of these? No, he did not. Just knowing the kind of thought processes are going on there, I thought you might want to look at that. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to change tracks tonight. And we're not going to talk about the Godhead. We're going to talk about the Nakash. <laughs> what was the Nakash? Well, the Nakash is Hebrew for serpent. And is translated in the King James Bible in the third chapter of Genesis as serpent. It means subtle and has a connotation of beauty. And Adam Clark said that... Uh, the great expositor said that the uh, Nakash probably walked on two legs. Now, some things that we know and some things we can infer. It says, now the serpent or the Nakash was more subtle, even the King James brings that out, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the Nakash was created by God. And consequently, we can infer that Adam also named the Nakash because he named all the other creatures, animals in the garden. Now, we can also infer this, that the, the beast of burden, the cattle, the ox, were not found to be a helpmate for Adam. When he reviewed all the creation, he could not find a helpmate. Now we can infer that he also considered the Nakash as a helpmate. I think that would be a valid inference. Although it doesn't specifically state that he considered a cow, or that he considered a bird, or that he considered one beast, but it said that in the garden there was found no helpmate for Adam, hence we have the creation of Eve. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, the Nakash, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now that's an interesting little addition to what we do know that God said. Because God, <laughs> Eve added into that, that ye shall not touch it. So there's an assumption we can make here is, did she get that direction directly from God, or was it trans came through Adam to Eve, don't eat of this tree? I think we can probably presume that Adam indoctrinated Eve in not eating of the fruit. But yet, in the redition of the story, she states to the serpent, and you shouldn't even touch it. And the serpent said, and the Kosh said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, for food, I'm sorry, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, I've been wondering this. The Nakash, in his temptation to Eve, stated that ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Question, is it possible that Eve saw other creatures, possibly angels of some type, that perhaps ate of this tree? Perhaps she observed something? 
because it says here that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. I just get the idea here that there's more to the story, that she was perhaps watching perhaps what we would call watchers who are angels that perhaps, and this is only a question, is did they have access to the fruit of this tree, but Adam and Eve did not? You know, did they watch angels eat of the fruit? And perhaps this is where the temptation came from, the desire to be like gods or to be like they were. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, oftentimes, this story is sort of mistold. The fact is, Adam was there with Eve at the time she ate. Because it states in the uh, sixth verse that, he, that, and gave also unto her husband with her. So he was there beside her. Now, why didn't he open his mouth and say, hey, no, we, we, we shouldn't do this? I don't know the answer to that. I do have another question, though. What caused the Nakash to tempt Eve? What was the Nakash's motive? Now, in the book of uh, Jubilees, just as an interesting side note, states that all of the creatures of the garden spoke one language, and they spoke Hebrew. And in some of the Pseudopagrapha, it also mentions again that the first language was Hebrew. And there is a, and I can't remember where it is at the moment, but in one of the minor prophets, it speaks again at the end of the world, at the end of time, mankind will again speak one language, Hebrew. Uh, the Nakash traditionally speaking, has been thought of as a serpent that crawled around a tree. In fact, you see paintings of that oftentimes, where in reality, it was the curse upon the Nakash that caused him to run, eat upon, you know, the dust of the ground. Um, in the third chapter, the fourteenth verse, the Lord God said unto the serpent, the Nakash, because thou, interesting here, remember we talked earlier about the serpent, the Nakash, had a real, evidently had a free will and some kind of moral standard, because God says this to him, because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. Now I infer, again, like Adam Clark does, from that statement that the Nakash originally walked upon legs, either two or four. You know, possibly like we think about chimpanzees and monkeys, they walk on two two legs. I think the Nakash was very much of a two-legged walker, so to speak, because the curse is that he has to go upon his belly and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And this is what you are talking about earlier. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between the Nakash, the serpent that we know today, and the woman, and then between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that is actually a messianic pro uh, prophecy. It refers to the coming of Christ. When it says that uh, he'll bruise thy head. Christ in his death and resurrection definitely bruised the head of the serpent, metaphorically speaking. Now, before we go there and talk about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, because there is some 
uh, misunderstandings about that. I don't know if you've ever heard of what's called the serpent seed doctrine. It's heretical. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, what it is. It's very much in the now on the internet and so forth. But I mentioned this earlier in the second chapter, the 20th verse, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found unhelp meat for him. Now, in that statement, I assume that the Nakash was also considered because that only makes sense. Now, Adam, let me go back and give a little notion on this too. Adam, in the 15th verse of the second chapter, and the Lord God which is interesting, by the way, up until <laughs> that 15th verse, uh, Elohim is used in the Hebrew. But as soon as God starts dealing with man, it becomes Lord God or Jehovah God. And there's a real striking um, notation in that, that God has changed from being Elohim which, by the way, comes from the Hebrew word El, which means the sky god. So Elohim is actually a play on the Hebrew word El. El, like I said, is a single deity, and it's a sky god. Elohim is plural, and nobody knows why it's plural. It's very unusual in the Hebrew alphabet in phonetics to be plural. So it's sort of a pun by saying, okay, El is the sky god and above everything. Well, here is Elohim, who is even bigger and larger than him. And by the way, for those who might be interested in Hebrew, as a side note, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created. Look that up in the original Hebrew. Remember, Hebrew reads not from left to right, but from right to left. And you'll see in original Hebrew two little letters right there next to Elohim. It's the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the beginning and the ending. As we know in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's there in the Hebrew. You won't find it in a translation, but you'll find it in the Masoretic text. I think it's called the Teve and the Beit. It's, anyway, the first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet are right there, just sitting there. And it's done that way in a couple of other places, and nobody knows why. <laughs> you know, Elohim, the beginning and the end. It's very interesting. But this is what I want to, want to bring out. And this is subjection, and this is a question. Most commentators assume that the serpent, the Nakash, because this is prior to him actually becoming a snake like we normally think of that word, the Nakash is normally thought to have been overcome by Satan, or Lucifer, or to have been empowered, or at least have been enlightened and challenged by him. But the problem that creates is this, is number one, when did Lucifer fall? And number two, that implies that Lucifer was in the garden. It nowhere says that in Genesis. It nowhere says Satan or Lucifer was in the garden. Fact, it says this. That, um, and the Lord God, again, in his relationship, covenant relationship with mankind, he calls himself Jehovah God. 
form man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. First thing. Second thing. Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Which brings up another good question. Where is Eden? And there he put the man whom he had formed. Adam was not formed in the garden. He was formed, created, and put in the garden. Now the question is, why was he put in the garden, and what was he supposed to be doing in the garden? And then you can ask me where Eden was. <laughs> In the 15th verse, he put, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word garden in the Hebrew is gan, and it means a walled or hedged area. Now, why was Adam put in a hedged area? a walled area and told to dress it and to keep it. What is he supposed to keep it from? What's he supposed to protect it from? Where is Lucifer during all of this? When does he fall? Nowhere in here do we read about it. Or do we? In Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in the second verse, it says, And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, Isaiah said that God created the earth habitable. But there we find in the second verse of Genesis, that the earth is without form and void. Now we can follow that very phrase on over to Jeremiah and find a very poetic uh, description of the earth being without form and void and destruction taking place and this type of thing. And this is known as the construction, ruin, reconstruction theory. Some people call it the gap theory. Now what it does do is that it allows for an indeterminate amount of time between the first verse and the second verse, millions of years. And it also satisfies the criticalness of the earth being recreated. Is that possible? Does the Hebrew support that in seven days? Verse 6, and you rested on the 7th. In fact, it does. In the very beginning verse where it says God created the heavens and the earth, that word created, we build an entire Christian doctrine on it. It's called, the doctrine's called ex nihilo. It means that this is created out of nothingness. God created the heavens and the earth without any prior substance. And that's very important. But when we come down later and we see in like the seventh verse, and God made the firmament, it's an entirely different Hebrew word. Think about it like this without going into depth in the Hebrew. Think about it simply like this. If I go into my backyard and I make a sandcastle, I take the sand and I build it up and I make a, a castle out of it. Have I created a sand castle or have I made a sand castle? I have made a sand castle out of substances that were already there. So the gap, if you were, theory that was first introduced by Phineas Dake actually fulfills the criticalness of the Hebrew that the earth be made in six days and also explains the geological formations that have taken millions of years to develop. Oil, 
some of the uh, geologic, geologic record. It just it couldn't have happened in 6,000 years. Most biblical scholars state that from the flood to now was some between 6,000 and 10,000 years. You can't produce oil in that, that number of years. It takes millions of years. So let's say that Lucifer fell between the first verse and the second verse of Genesis. It's ideal. It makes everything work. It creates a literal six-day creation, or as we say, recreation. It explains the great length of geologic time. But it does not explain what the Nakash's motive was. Nowhere in Genesis does it say that Lucifer was in a garden. In fact, I would make the argument that if Lucifer was in the garden, that Adam fell down on his job and actually sinned prior to eating of the apple. If he allowed Lucifer to come into the gan, the walled, the set apart, hedged area, and he wasn't tilling it as you might speak, watching it and protecting it, he fell down on the job. Well, I don't think that's what happened. I don't think Lucifer was anywhere near the garden. My personal opinion is that Nakash had a personal motive for what he did. Notice that the Nakash went after Eve. He had an affinity to, to, toward her. He didn't attack Adam with his thoughts or his, his inquisition. He did Eve. I personally think that a very logical explanation is that the Nakash was overlooked as being Adam's helpmate and was jealous. And it was his own personal volition that he tempted Eve to cause her to fall. Obviously, he knew of the restriction. It obviously was no secret. Now, because of that, it did fall into the, the world, did fall into sin, as we know humanity sin. But I would also say that sin existed prior to that, because Lucifer, Lucifer fell between the first and the second verse. But mankind himself was put in the garden to be protected, to be hedged about from the sin that was around him. And had Adam not eaten of the fruit, we'd be in a world today that was protected, that was hedged off from the sin that's taken place in the universe. So the Nakash, I think, acted out of his own selfish motives. But as many people do, it fell right into Lucifer's hands. He's the one ultimately that uh, was profited from, from the... Uh, decisions that were made. Now, I mentioned earlier that I would mention where the Garden of Eden was. You thought I forgot, but I really didn't. The verses dealing with the Garden of Eden are vague because it mentions two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. 